Um, thanks. So today I'm going to talk about the measurement and behaviour of copper in wine. And firstly, thanks to Eno Forum for organising this conference and inviting me to talk. So I'm going to talk about copper in wine in general terms, and then we're going to look at the colorimetric measurement of total copper in wine. Then the ability to measure different forms of copper in wine. <laughs> we'll then look at the behaviour of those forms of copper in wine, particularly as wine ages, and the ability to remove different forms of copper from wine. So copper has various sources in wine. One of those can be as, uh, as sourced from the vineyard. But fortunately, most of the, this copper is lost during fermentation. So here we have some uh, Chardonnay juice samples. So all exactly the same, just modified in their copper concentration. So from one milligram per litre all the way up to seven milligrams per litre. And after fermentation, we see that most of that copper is removed. We just have a small amount left. So yeast is fairly efficient at precipitating that copper uh, with the yeast cells. But if we zoom in, we see that we still have more copper in the wine that had uh, more copper in the juice, even though it's had a much lower concentration. So even though copper hasn't been added to these wines at the wine stage, we still have more copper in the wine that had uh, more copper in the juice. So we can also get uh, contamination of wine if it touches brass, so that can be a source of copper. But most wineries nowadays don't have so much brass uh, as they're fitted out with stainless steel. But we can also get addition of copper to wine by the winemaker. So if a wine has hydrogen sulphide, that presents as a rotten egg uh, off odour. That's quite volatile. If we add a little bit of copper too, it very efficiently binds to that hydrogen sulphide, converting it to a non-odorous, involatile product. So that I'm referring to as sulphide bound copper. Probably not as simple as copper sulphide in wine, there'll be other impurities absorbed on the surface of that um, copper sulphide. So that's why I just refer to it as sulphide bound copper. But it's certainly not a simple product. It forms as very small particles that don't tend to settle out very easily. And they're also small enough to pass through filters based on size retention. So because of this, they can persist uh, through production and make it to the bottled wine. There's also been some studies by a uh, Spanish research group of Vicente Ferreira, linking this form of copper to eventual release of unbound um, hydrogen sulfide in wines stored in low oxygen. So for the measurement of total copper in wine, generally uh, larger wineries might have access to this high-end equipment. So equipment can, that can measure copper in that range of 0 to 0 0.8 milligrams per litre. But medium and small size wineries certainly won't have um, uh, availability of this type of instrumentation. So we've designed a um, colorimetric measure for total copper in wine that utilises this BCA reagent. So it's quite efficient at latching onto copper one and forming a purple coloured complex. So the more copper in the wine, the more intense purple colour we get after we add this reagent. One catch is that we generally um, need to use a 40 millimetre uh, glass cuvette, as this gives us four times the sensitivity as a standard 10 millimetre glass cuvette. And I'll show you a reason for that why uh, later. Not so critical for total copper measurements, but definitely for copper forms, uh, that 40 millimetre cuvette is needed. So for this uh, measurement, we use 10 mil of wine. We just add, add that to a centrifuge tube. We add a little bit of silver, because that's good at releasing copper from binding agents in the wine. A bit of ascorbic acid to aid the reduction of copper and then BCA, which forms our purple coloured complex with copper. We then uh, syringe filter that solution and measure the absorbance at 563 nanometers. So a measure of that purple colour of the solution. BCA isn't expensive. Last time I bought it, it was about $110 for five grams. And that allows 3,500 determinations. At the very least, we need to analyze a wine sample and a blank. So the blank is all those reagents except not the BCA added, just sub to subtract background. 
Uh, with those two samples, we can get a good approximation of the copper concentration in the wine. But if we want to be more accurate, we used uh, quantification by standard additions and analyzed samples through three and four. There is a 30 minute incubation step where we leave the samples at room temperature for 30 minutes and probably another five to 10 minutes for uh, preparation and measurement. So it's probably a 40 minute um, uh, analysis time all up. So how does our colorimetric measure uh, match up to some of these more high end instrumental analyses? And it's quite good. So using our 40 millimeter glass cuvette, we get nice measurement uh, from 0.8 down to 0.015 milligram per litre. On the y-axis here, we have the results from ICP and the x-axis results by the colorimetric analysis of about 50 odd uh, white wines. And um, we can see the slope of this uh, line of best fit is near one. So that's uh, indicating good agreement between the techniques. If we did the analysis, the colorimetric analysis with a 10 millimetre cuvette instead of a 40 millimetre cuvette, then we're really just missing those samples at the low end. So for total copper, it's not the uh, biggest drama if we just use a 10 millimetre cuvette. So that's total copper in wine. What about different forms of copper in wine? What are these different forms and how do you measure them? And how do you measure them easily? So we've done a lot of work looking at what the different forms of copper in wine are. We've um, published a couple of papers on this, looking at different components of wine and how they affect the instrumental measure of copper in wine. And based on this, we've come to classify three broad categories of copper in wine. The first is copper organic acid complexes. The organic acids are generally tartaric and malic acid but they could be some of the other minor organic acids as well. Then we have our copper thiol species where copper is interacting with a thiol compound. So thiol compound, some compound with a sulfur and hydrogen group on it. So glutathione is a quite a well-known thiol compound in wine and can be quite high in white wines, um, in certain white wines. And we can have other thiol compounds that are beneficial in wine and those that are detrimental to wine. And then we have our sulfide bound form of copper that I've mentioned already. So over the past 10 years or so, we've been measuring these different forms of copper in wine. And unfortunately we have used a lot of different terminology as time has progressed for these different forms of copper. So just to run through those, sometimes we've referred to them as sulfhydryl free and sulfhydryl bound copper. So sulfhydryl just referring to the fact that these, some of these binding agents have sulfur and the others don't. And then in some cases we shorten that further to be a bit more like free and bound SO2. But technically that copper organic acid isn't free copper, it is bound to the organic acid. So sulfhydryl free is probably a better general name for that. And then we've also referred to them as copper fraction one, two and three. And in our early electrochemical studies, the copper organic acid we've referred to as labile copper. So a bit of a mix of terminology there, but it just helps to define that early. So how do we measure these different forms of copper in wine? So there's three different approaches, electrochemistry, colorimetry, and an absorptive approach. The last two are ready-made for wineries. They're nice and applied and uh, relatively easy to use, whereas the first one's more research orientated technique. I'll just show some results that we've got from electrochemistry because they're quite interesting in themselves, but I won't go into detail about this particular technique. So it's the electrochemical technique of stripping potentiometry, and we applied it here to 20 white wines. Um, so they're just commercially bottled white wines that varied in age from one to eight years old. And this electrochemical technique pretty much could detect the copper organic acid fraction, but it couldn't detect those other fractions of copper. So just by subtracting the copper it could detect from total copper in the wines, we could by difference get the amount of copper sulfide and copper uh, soil, a combined fraction in the wines.
And of course, what you notice is quite dramatically, there's really not much copper organic acid in these 20 white wines, um, but there's a dramatic amount of copper sulphide and copper xyle. So they really dominate the copper in these wines. And there's two uh, potential reasons for that. So at bottling, copper can already be sulfhydryl bound. And two, copper can also become bound during bottle aging to these uh, sulfur compounds. And we'll see an example of that later. But with this same um, 20, 20 wines, we also linked the copper organic acid concentration in those wines to a measure of the free hydrogen sulfide in the wines. So this is a measure, uh, as far as we know, of hydrogen sulfide in the wines that's not bound to metal ions. So it's gonna be more consistent with that hydrogen sulfide that you're gonna smell uh, and contribute to reductive odors more than the H2S that might be in the wine, but bound tightly to metals. And so what we found it was there tended to be a threshold level of, level of copper organic acid around that 0 0.02 milligram per liter. But once you had that amount of copper organic acid in, in the white wine, there was no accumulation of free H2S. And once you got below that concentration of copper organic acid, then in some wines, not all wines, but in some wines, that, that's when you started to get accumulation of this free H2S. And uh, we analyzed some red wines as well by this electrochemical technique, and we saw a similar result. Again, a threshold level of copper organic acid. If a wine had above that, there was no free H2S accumulation. But once you got below that, there were some wines where you did get free H2S accumulation. So we've got this link between the concentration of copper organic acid and an inhibition of the accumulation of free H2S. But the big catch is that um, this protection by copper organic acids against accumulation of free H2S is only temporary. As later we'll see, its concentration decreases with wine age. So that was electrochemistry, some results from um, that particular technique. So let's look at these other two techniques that are a little bit more wine applied than the electrochemical technique. The first is our colorimetric technique. So this is a reminder of what you're adding to do the measure of total copper in wine. And to measure the copper forms in wine, it's actually easier because you can leave out one of the reagents. So all you do is not add the silver. You do everything else exactly the same. Um, but Actually, when we add our reagents to the wine, so 10 ml of wine, BCA and ascorbic acid, we do a measurement straight away. So we filter and get the spectro reading straight away. And this will be a measure of our copper fraction one, the copper organic acids. So by straight away, usually it takes about 10 seconds to filter and do that absorbance measurement, or 10 to 30 seconds. Then we um, add the reagents to another batch of 10 a mill of wine, and this time we leave it for 30 minutes. And then that tends to be a measure of copper organic acids and copper thiol compounds combined, so copper fraction one and two. And by subtracting the first measure, we can get that measure of copper fraction two. And then by difference from total copper in the wine, we can get a measure of the copper sulfide fraction. So we can get our three fractions of copper by this colorimetric technique. So this shows 15 white wines that have had a recent addition of copper at variable levels. And applying the colorimetric technique to these 15 wines, we see we get a measure of copper fraction one, copper fraction two, and copper fraction three. So we've got varying amounts of each of those three fractions of copper in these particular wines. But what happens during wine aging? So here we have a Chardonnay wine at bottling, and we have a low amount of copper fraction three, about 0.05 milligram per liter. And we have higher amounts of copper fraction one and two, so copper organic acid and copper thiol. So if we look at the copper organic acid first, how it changes during the aging of this Chardonnay wine at 14 degrees, we see a rapid decrease in that copper organic acid, and then a relatively uh, slower decrease thereafter. 
For the copper thiol fraction, we see a little increase at first, but then a steady decrease. And then for our copper sulfide, we see that gradual increase during the aging of the wine before it tends to plateau. So we see those three different trajectories of copper in our wine, just apply our colorimetric measure um, to that particular Chardonnay. In terms of that threshold level of copper organic acid to impede accumulation of free H2S, we sort of passed that threshold somewhere between eight months to 14 months for this particular wine. And we did measure the free H2S in this wine and we didn't see any accumulation of free H2S. So even though this wine dropped below that threshold of copper organic acid, we didn't see any free H2S accumulate. But we did see a large concentration of H2S bound to um, copper uh, increase during age that sort of matched this increase in copper sulfide. So for this sample, if we had used a 10 millimeter cuvette instead of a 40 millimeter cuvette for the analysis, then we'd miss all this data grayed out. So for the copper measurement of copper forms, that 40 millimeter cuvette is really useful. So there are questions we can't uh, um, answer at this stage, some really interesting questions, is how quickly do different wines bind copper organic acid? Are they similar to the wine we showed or are they all different? And will free H2S appear in a wine after the copper organic acid disappears? How do you know if it will and how soon? So these are good questions and these are questions we can't answer at the moment, but we're not far away from answering them. What about another method for measuring copper forms in wine? So this one just utilizes depth filters uh, that have diatomaceous earth in them. So we pass 100 ml of wine through the depth filter and it's quite efficient at uh, trapping copper sulfide. So copper fraction three for that volume for this uh, through this type of filter. And then we just measure the copper in the filtrate, which will be copper fractions one and two. So copper organic acid and copper thiols. And you can use any total copper method for measurement of the copper in the filtrate. So it could be the colorimetric measure or it could be any other method in your lab. So this was our colorimetric measure of 15 white wines and we could see the different uh, fractions of copper. So we used the absorptive technique on those same 15 wines and we saw quite a similar result. The only difference is that copper fractions one and two are combined in this technique rather than different. So we've got three techniques to measure these three broad categories of copper in wine. And the colorimetric method has the benefit that you get all three of those different fractions of copper. The other two methods, you get one fraction by itself and the other two combined. And in our recent paper, we've done comparisons of the different instru instruments for the same fraction of copper, and we get good agreement using the different independent techniques. So what about uh, removal of copper from wine? So copper can be removed from white wine that contains protein. If you use bentonite, generally you'll see a decrease in the concentration of total copper of um, wine in varying amounts. Um, you can also use diatomaceous earth depth filters as we demonstrated in our absorptive method, but we're still studying how efficient that is to remove that sulfide bound copper on a large scale. And I'll talk now about PVI, PVP. So we've just published a recent paper on this, looking at uh, the application of this particular copolymer to remove different fractions of copper from wine. So this copolymer is a polymer of these two particular functional groups that are quite efficient for latching onto copper and removing it from wine. So we've done a study um, looking at the efficiency of this copolymer to remove copper from wine based on the pH of wines. And what we found is that it removes copper more efficiently when the pH of the wine is lower. So this study was done on wines with more than 0.15 milligram per litre of copper. And we saw, um, so that white wines that have lower pH, we saw better removal than red wines that have higher pH. 
Then we looked at four white wines and a model wine. So the model wine is just a tartaric acid solution with ethanol and copper and hydrogen sulfide added. And we see the varying amounts of copper fraction one, two and three in this model wine and the white wines. Then we treated uh, all those wines with PVP and we saw a big reduction in the total copper concentration in those wines. And we actually saw efficient removal of all the forms of copper from those wines, regardless of whether they were copper fraction one, two or three. So PVP, IPVP seems efficient at removing all those forms of copper from white wine. Then we did the same to red wines. So we had four red wines. Red wine doesn't tend to have much um, or any copper thiol fraction that we've measured, just copper fraction one and three. And after application of the PV, IPVP, we get a reduction in total copper, but not as to the same extent as for the white wine. So related to that pH effect. We did see um, that copper fraction one, so the copper organic acid fraction was more difficult to remove from red wine than white wine. So perhaps that higher pH in red wine was um, hindering removal of that copper organic acid fraction. Um, copper fraction three was efficiently removed from the red wine. When we added copper back to those PVI treated samples, um, we found that it wasn't rebound by sulfide. And that was important because if the PVI PVP was just uh, ripping copper off sulfide and removing it from the wine and leaving behind the smelly sulfide, that wouldn't be a good thing. But when we added copper to back to uh, PVI PVP treated samples, it didn't reform copper sulfide, but presented itself as copper fraction one and copper fraction two, implying the sulfide wasn't left behind to rebind the copper. We also measured uh, hydrogen sulfide in the wines. So in this case, the white wines before and after PVI PVP treatment. And this was a measure of H2S that measured the free and the metal bound uh, form of hydrogen sulfide or a proportion of it at least. So after PVI PVP treatment on the left, we see the reduction in copper and the sulfide bound copper. And then on the right, we see a reduction in the measured H2S in all those wines as well. So PVI, PVP isn't just removing the copper um, from sulfide, it's removing both the copper and the sulfide. So just to conclude, um, I've shown the calorimetric measure of copper in wine that can be used to measure total copper and different forms of copper in wine. It's quite a simple technique using reagents and equipment that can be found in a lot of wineries. Uh, the exception is that 40 millimeter cuvette, but that just gives you that extra bit of sensitivity that's quite useful for measuring copper forms. We looked at the absorptive methodology for copper forms in wine, and we saw that those copper forms can change during wine aging. We tend to see decreases in copper organic acid uh, during aging of wine, and I forgot to mention they were all under screw caps, so low oxygen conditions. And we see an increase in the sulfide bound copper during that aging process as well. We also saw that copper organic acid fraction can repress accumulation of free hydrogen sulfide in wine. But an important catch is that its existence is generally only temporary, but we're still learning more about that aspect. And then PVI, PVP can remove copper from wine, it removes all forms efficiently from white wine and the sulphide bound copper form more efficiently from red wine. And then sulphide is removed uh, with the sulphide bound copper. And then finally, just acknowledgements. I'd like to acknowledge my postdoc researchers that have done a lot of this work, Sydney Zhang and Nicholas Contadakis, and my collaborator, Jeff Scholary, group from AWI for their assisting with the work on PVI, PVP, and Yasha from an artist for collaborating and um, inviting me to talk as well. Thank you.